of subject. Regret. <laughs> no one likes to have a life full of regrets. In fact, you don't even like to regret even one time in your life. You want to be successful? You want all your actions to be fruitful? And you want to feel that in your own way, your life has prospered. If not financially, then in terms of relationships, in terms of respect, claim, in terms of your own standards of fulfillment. But I'd like to explain to you today that the process of material existence involves nothing but regrets. <laughs> now let's first look at your life as a consumer. And of course, no one likes to think of themselves as a consumer. Although, the main impetus of American society, let's speak of other societies, but American society in particular, the main impetus is to treat you as a consumer. And that means you should have regrets. Because the more regrets you have, the more you'll continue on the treadmill of trying to get better and better and better. So, so much of advertising is designed to make you feel inadequate. And you may say that you're too sophisticated, you're too sharp to fall for it. <laughs> Forget it. <laughs> Inadequacy means that you're missing something. You haven't realized it. We're here to tell you that you're missing something. There's a gap in your life. And by engaging in such and such a material activity, whether consumerism or sensual indulgence, whatever, by engaging in that activity, you stand a high chance of relieving that inadequacy. And if you don't endeavor materially, how are you ever going to fill that hole in your heart? How are you ever going to relieve yourself of the anxieties that are besetting you? You've got to act because you are inadequate. <laughs> and we've done you the favor of alerting you to your inadequacy. So that way, your regrets are capitalized on. You regret that you can't be a successful enjoyer. You regret that you can't engage in the process of material gratification without problems. You're made to regret that. But even if you think you get what you want, the regret factor is still there. We're talking about something called opportunity costs. Whatever you choose to do in your material life, sooner or later you begin to think, what if I had taken the other road? What if I had done the other option? This is the nature of Krishna's illusory energy that you're always going to think after you make a choice that what about if I had gone the other way? So this is known as the cost of opportunity. No matter what you choose, you choose to take your vacation in Acapulco instead of Las Vegas, when you get to Acapulco, inevitably you're going to start thinking, I wonder what Las Vegas would have been like. <laughs> but that's the, now, I'm explaining this to you. So you can understand that this is the nature of the material energy. And because you have that regret, oh, we had an okay time in Acapulco. We could have done better in Las Vegas. Next time we went to Las Vegas. This regret drives you onward. But that's not the only thing that's pushing you forward in your material life. 
There's also something called adaptation. Whatever material happiness you get, sooner or later you become accustomed to it. It, it loses its sparkle, like a carbonated beverage that loses its fizz. You can't remain content with what you have. This is not possible within the realm of Krishna's illusory energy. The more we understand how this maya, this energy of hallucination works, the more we see that we cannot win through material endeavor. So much of Krishna's instructions in Bhagavad Gita is meant to teach you that you can't win driving up the material road. And this is not simply a point of sentiment. It's not a point of just religious belief. This is actually a scientific fact that you can experience in your life. That whenever you engage with Krishna's material energy, you always come up short. Yet, you can't give up. There's something that drives you onward and onward. Even though you're always regretting, you're always left unfulfilled, and you're always feeling inadequate. Once you understand how this illusory energy of Krishna's works, naturally you would look for options. The question is, how long do we want to go in our life before we consider there could be other ways to live, other ways to engineer our lifestyle? We spoke about regret in terms of various activities. Why did I buy this? I should have bought that. Why did I go there for vacation? I could have gone there. Why did I choose this person to marry? <laughs> Could have been the other person. <laughs> this kind of regret is always there. Don't even beat, beat up on yourself so much because of it. Understand it's the nature of contact with Krishna's illusory energy. That you're always going to just miss the boat. <laughs> just miss the train. <laughs> Let's consider now the worst kind of regret. Those who work at hospices, taking care of the terminally ill, they say that there are five basic regrets that most people have upon giving up their body. First of all, there's blame. After denial, no, it can't be true. It can't be true that I'm leaving my body. It must be some mistake. After that, you become angry. And then you start to blame. Someone is at fault because I'm dying. Sociologists have found that in the USA, because it's known to be a religious country, many people upon being given the news that they're terminally ill, that they're leaving, who do they blame? They blame God. I, I went to the church or temple most, most days of my life. I, I believed in my religion, and now, look what's happening to me. What kind of God is this? So the USA is known for that, for people blaming God upon their imminent departure. Uh, so Vas Prabhu was mentioning how I spend time as a governing body commissioner in Australia and New Zealand. There, people don't blame God because these countries have left religion 50 years ago. <laughs> <laughs> They're social welfare countries where uh, you pay high taxes, Taxes that would make an American faint. But you get universal health care, you get universal this, you get that, unemployment this, unemployment that. Uh, so 
Who gets the blame when someone is terminally ill and receives the news they die? They blame the government. <laughs> you got to blame someone. <laughs> no question of God. But I paid so much taxes to this government. Why don't they spend enough research on cancer? It's all their fault. Once you get beyond the blame stage and the hospice workers, the hospice staff is there to help you through denial, through anger, through blame, then there's regret. Now it's not simply the regret of why did I go to Acapulco instead of Las Vegas. Now you're looking back at how you spent your whole life and Finally, it hits you that I should have lived my life another way. So what are the five top regrets of a dying person? Hopefully, you'll never experience this. But what are those top five regrets? I've written them down for you. So you see, what is the opposite of a bhakti lifestyle and the result of a bhakti lifestyle? In Bhagavad Gita, many of you know, Krishna says that if you're thinking of him upon giving up this body, then you attain the perfection of life, you're relieved from the cycle of repeated birth and death, and you go to Krishna. That is the perfect life with no regrets. But suppose... Unfortunately, you live a life in which you fail to understand what is the real purpose, what is the real goal. And no doubt you'll be afflicted by at least one, if not more, of these five most popular regrets. Number one, why did I have the courage to live my own life? Why did I have to live my life in terms of everyone else's expectations? That's the number one regret. It's too late now for me to do anything about it. <laughs> decade after decade, I was just dancing to someone else's tune. At the workplace, at home, I was always trying to fit into someone else's expectations. Why? 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 Why couldn't I have just done whatever I wanted to do. <laughs> this regret burns so intensely in the heart. I want you to put yourself in those shoes. Here you are in your last months in this body. And feel the pressure on you. I've only got a short time left. How many decades of my life did I waste trying to fit someone else's image. The regret burns your heart so much. But that's not the only regret that's weighing down on you. Regret number two, and especially in the USA, this is a very uh, prevalent regret. Why did I work so hard? <laughs> what was I trying to do? Who was I trying to prove myself to? <laughs> it's only at that moment that you realize you can't take it with you. <laughs> you say it like that, you know, people say it like that all their life. Well, you know, you can't take it with you, you know. When you're gone, you're gone. The impact doesn't hit them until these last months. And then the regret tears them apart. All I did was work, work. I was telling some devotees today, I had a cousin, I have a cousin who, when he was 25, he got a post in the health department in Washington, D.C., high position, and stayed at that high level for 30 years, he retired at 55. And he was always complaining about the stress, the strain, and so I, I said to him, why did you wait so long? You could have stepped out at an earlier age. He looked at me 
you're a swami, you're a monk, you don't understand. <laughs> <laughs> Once you stick your foot in, they don't let you pull it out. They know how to keep you with your nose pressed to the grindstone. They, they lay it on you. You are a top man. Your department has always been the best. When crunch time comes, we know we can rely on you. <laughs> and they give you a you know, certificate at a banquet every year, and they make you feel so wanted, and they make you feel so key, key personnel. <laughs> and you just, it's hard to walk away from all that, because you want meaning in your life. You want to be appreciated. So he told me, you don't understand, it's not so easy to pull your foot out. <laughs> So anyway, he got a retirement package that was very attractive at the age of 55. He retired. Uh, after two years, he couldn't stand the boredom at home. So now, uh, he's working overtime as a consultant, making the big money. He knows that he's, his life is being wasted, but he can't extract himself. So in this way, you can see why people in their last months, when they've been diagnosed with terminal illness, they voice this acute regret. Why did I work so hard? You don't see it until it's too late. Or even if you see it before, you can't act on it. But then, death acts upon you. Regret number three. Why? Didn't I have the courage to express my feelings? To tell someone without fear that I love that person? Or to tell someone without fear that I can't stand your guts? <laughs> Why didn't I have that courage? <laughs> this is one of the top five regrets of the dying. Why couldn't I have been more for real and just said what I felt and acted that way? <laughs> This really affects people. The fourth one is, especially during this age of color, Shrimad Bhagavatam predicts that in this present age of darkness, meeting up with what you don't want and separation from what you do want, this is so prevalent. That means that families, Relationships are broken so easily, people separate and move far away from each other. This is predicted in the 12th canto of Srimad Bhagavatam as being one of the prominent symptoms of the present age. <coughs> so one of the topmost regrets of dying persons is, why didn't I stay more in touch with my friends? Because everyone's working so hard and moving here and there because of their work and divorces and remarriage and this and that. And they lose track of, you know, dear friends. It just, things happen. So the dying person regrets this so bitterly. When it's too late, you realize my relationships, my friends, are what mean so much to me. And then the last one of the top five. Why didn't I let myself be happy? Some other people have this idea that there's such a thing out there as material happiness, but I didn't allow myself to get it. Now from the viewpoint of, Sh of Bhagavad Gita and Srimad Bhagavatam, material happiness is an illusion. But if you spent your life pursuing it, you're going to regret it. It must be all my fault. I didn't get the happiness. Or I didn't let myself be happy. In other words, I know it's out there. I know material happiness exists. Everyone else is, is, has gotten it. But I didn't let myself get the material happiness. Krishna makes this easy on you by pointing out in Bhagavad Gita that actually there's no real substantial thing as material happiness. But we didn't take Krishna's instructions seriously, or we never had a chance to hear them or come in contact with them. So therefore, we 
you beat up on yourself in your last months. I should have just let myself be happy. As if happiness is under your control. Now what does Srimad Bhagavatam explain about that illusion? It explains, Yata Dukam Ayatmata. Just as distress comes to you without your pursuing it, similarly, material happiness will come to you. Palad Maharaj, the five-year-old extraordinary bhakti yogi, states this. And also Narada Muni explains this in the first channel of Bhagavatam. Why should you endeavor for material happiness when time will automatically bring you your karmic packet of material happiness, just as time brings you your packet of material distress. If I ask you here, how many of you in the room endeavor for distress? No one's working to be miserable. No one's striving to be miserable. But still, distress problems come. Similarly, Pallad Maharaj and Narada Muni say, your material happiness will come to you even if you don't endeavor for it, you'll get your right packet. And it's time that's delivering your happiness and distress in the appropriate amount according to your karma. So often when I'm speaking this point at universities, I was just speaking at University of Nevada, Las Vegas on Thursday, and I may make the same point Monday at USC, why endeavor for something? Why struggle? Why be in so much anxiety to get something that's going to come to you anyway? And what's the usual reaction? Are, are you trying to say we should just do nothing? And <laughs> if we don't endeavor for happiness, what are we going to do with our life? Or else they ask, what will happen to the world if everyone listens to what you say? People will just do nothing and the world will just collapse. Isn't the purpose of life to endeavor for happiness? If it's true that it just comes automatically, that gives us nothing to do. And then I have to point out that actually the purpose of a human being with the human form of life is not to strive for happiness or simply fight back distress. The purpose is to go to a higher level. Revive your connection to Krishna. In other words, the bhakti yogi, the Krishna conscious person, is also working. But the work is of a different quality. It's on a different platform. The striving to please Krishna, to reconnect with Krishna, that is not predetermined by your karma. That you have full freedom to transact. How much am I endeavoring to reconnect with Krishna? That is beyond material happiness and distress. This is why in Bhagavad Gita, Krishna advises you, rise above material happiness and distress. Now, no one would argue with Krishna about rising above distress, right? No one would protest that. But rise above happiness? Isn't the purpose of life to be happy? Why would we want to rise above happiness? We want Krishna to give us happiness. So what is Bhagavan Sri Krishna talking about when he says rise above happiness and distress? He's meaning clearly he wants to give you something far superior than the coming and going of happiness and distress which he describes to be like the coming and going of the winter and summer seasons. He says, Tam Bharata. He told Arjuna, you tolerate the comings and goings of happiness and distress. Now you might say, certainly I should learn how to tolerate the coming and going of distress, but why tolerate the coming and going of happiness? We should embrace that. That's the essence of life. Mundane happiness experts advise you, intend to be happy. 
take that big step with your choice you choose, I will be happy. And that's the great step forward in your life. Krishna doesn't waste your time in that way. You can intend to be materially happy and strive and double your striving for it, but you will not get more than what your karma allows you to get. Why not strive for something far superior, something non-material? Let's consider happiness from a material point of view. The predominant opinion is that 50% of your happiness is genetic. You can't do anything about it. It's all up to your, your genes and therefore, supposedly, parents can look back on their children and remember this was always a happy child or this was always a sad child. And supposedly that's due to your genetic makeup. We would say it's due to your karma. So in any case, the material analysis says, due to your genetic makeup, 50% of your happiness in life is already predetermined. And then there's another 10% from arrangements in your life, circumstances that are difficult to change. You can change them, but you can't do it overnight. It takes a great ordeal. That means things like marriage, where you live, where you work. So 50 plus 10, that's 60% of your happiness in life is more or less out of your reach. But 40%, you're told, that's the golden opportunity. You've got a window of 40%, and you can choose to be happy. What does Krishna say in Bhagavad Gita? 100% of your real happiness is up to you. That 100% is beyond your genetic makeup, your, your, your DNA, it's beyond your neurochemistry, it's beyond your circumstances. This is what Krishna is explaining to Arjuna in Bhagavad Gita. If you adopt Krishna's methodology, if you follow Krishna's process, you can access 100% happiness that has no beginning and end on the material platform. In one sense, devotees of Krishna are against material happiness, but that's because they know Krishna is offering something far superior. Why should you struggle for the inferior product when the superior product is made so easily available? Then again, it's natural that when we first approach bhakti, we have these preconceptions in our mind that I want to be happy. I want to be happy as I know it right now. That's okay. In Bhagavad Gita, Krishna says you can approach him with those kind of motives and you're still considered very fortunate because you're coming to Krishna with your material desires. Still, we should know that Krishna has much better things to give us. The happiness of devotional service has nothing to do with karma. It has nothing to do with material happiness or distress. And this is what Krishna is offering us by giving us a chance to engage our senses in his service. The mundane happiness analyst will tell you that you have a happiness set point due to your genetic makeup, due to what you inherited from your parents. It's the same they claim as your body weight. People, you may know, they try hard to lose weight and, and it, they can't go past a certain point. No matter what they do, their weight may fluctuate this way or that way, but it always returns to a kind of set point. So the mundane happiness researchers say that the happiness they know about, which of course is ordinary and mundane, return 
there's that set point. You can go through setbacks, you can be miserable, you can be elated and, and overjoyed, but sooner or later, the needle goes back to a certain place. Krishna doesn't offer that kind of set point happiness in Bhagavad Gita, because what Krishna is offering has nothing to do with the material energy. Therefore, Krishna can genuinely and authentically say, rise above happiness and distress. So this is the path to live and die without regrets. If something that good as what Krishna is offering is available and we strive for that, we won't have any regrets. In fact, what does Narada Muni say in the first canto of Bhagavatam? He says that if you cut back on your material duties, your material obligations, for the sake of engaging in Krishna's service, and then due to weak-mindedness, due to improper application in bhakti, you succumb to the illusory energy again. Narayuni says, that's still better than if you never endeavored for Krishna at all. That's still better than if you perform a lifetime of material activities perfectly. It's better that you tried for Krishna and failed than if you had a life of material so-called success. This is how powerful bhakti is and this is how powerful the real happiness of bhakti is. Because sometimes we're thinking, and Arjuna thought this in Bhagavad Gita also. He asked Krishna, what if, due to weak-mindedness, after I take to bhakti, I, I slip up? It seems I've lost it both ways, right? I wasn't materially successful, and I wasn't spiritually successful. I'm like a cloud that's just dissipated in the sky. I've got no standing, materially or spiritually. And that's when Krishna explained that one who attempts for the supreme good never meets up with inauspiciousness. It may be a temporary setback, but your spiritual credits are never lost. But if you perform all your material activities perfectly, what's the point? At the time of death, you've got these five regrets and more. It's the nature of being in contact with Krishna's illusory energy that you'll have regrets. You can never get fulfillment through contact with the illusory energy. Education, real education, means to understand this point. As soon as I'm interacting with the material energy, I'm going to be disappointed, I'm going to be let down, although I'm promised everything. Education means to understand this. If on the other hand, we take to bhakti, even if we, and you don't have to slip up. <laughs> when Srila Prabhupada would explain this point, he would always point out, you don't have to slip up. You have all the ingredients for success, but even if you do, you're still better off. Think about that. <laughs> I don't know if we have any gamblers out in the audience. But if you want to gamble, you gamble on Krishna. You'll never lose. But even if you think that you'll lose, all your material life, you've been a loser, so what's one more loss? <laughs> <laughs> so gamble on Krishna. <laughs> you can't lose. And be humble and admit that material life means you're already a loser, so <laughs> why not go for it? <laughs> this is how to live a life with no regrets and how to die with no regrets. Don't think
think that your material life is going to be different. This is such a common hallucination. I'm going to do a certain material activity. I'm going to live my life in a certain material way. And don't try to tell me that billions of others have done it before. No, no. My life's going to be different. <laughs> my work life's going to be different. My family life is going to be different. My children will be different. <laughs> Everyone always thinks like that. And at the time of death, what do they realize? If not earlier, at least at the time of death, they realize it. It's all been the same thing. I'm regretting. Why didn't I do this? Why didn't I do that? The devotees of Krishna are very grateful to Krishna. They're very grateful to Srila Prabhupada for giving us a chance to live a life with no regrets. This is the rarest benediction. No great acquisition in material life can match it. Not even you win the lottery for a couple of hundred million dollars. It's nothing compared to, be, to being able to live a life with no regrets and give up your body with no regrets. Two years ago or so, there was one person in the state of Missouri. He won the lottery for $200 million. The odds against that are so great. Two months later, he won the lottery again for another $100 million. Like, wow. Why couldn't that happen to me? And I, I saw the, a picture of the guy. He was about 55 years old. He looked miserable. <laughs> and the reporters asked him, what are you going to do with all this money? You won the lottery twice in two months. <laughs> Total like 300 million. You're the luckiest guy in the world. <laughs> what am I going to do? Um, I think I'm going to make my house bigger. And uh, I think I'm, I'm probably going to stop working, although I'm a little afraid to do that. <laughs> <laughs> You see how karma works? He cannot exceed this packet of material happiness that's due to him. The way the illusion energy works is you're pushed to think. If you just change, then your life will be happy. If Joe is with Jill, Joe is thinking, ah, oh, Jill, oh, she just she's lost that magic. If I switch to Gene, oh, then I'll be into something. <laughs> or Jane is with Sam and you know Sam is just not up to the mark anymore. If I switch to Tommy, oh, then I'll be happy. Uh, but what does the law of karma teach you? That, but, yes, you can change all those things. It's not predetermined that you have to be with Sam instead of Tommy or Jill instead of Jane. That's not predetermined. What's predetermined is the amount of happiness you're going to get in your relationship. <laughs> you can see through this. You save yourself so much trouble. <laughs> okay, fit. you can use your tiny independence to change from Jill to Jean. That you can do. And you make such a big deal out of it. <sighs> Finally get out of that one. This one's going to be much better. Happy days are here again. Okay. No. Whether it's Jill or Jean, the same packet of material happiness will come to you. This is hard for Westerners to see. This is why India used to be peaceful. <laughs> because they had this ingrained understanding that what's the point in juggling so many material circumstances when you cannot alter your happiness and distress? It's, it's not going to happen. So therefore, in Indian families, in the past, they didn't mind if their parents arranged their marriage, and this was arranged, and that was arranged, because they knew, well, I'm going to get whatever I'm supposed to get, so I might as well cooperate. <laughs> Why should I endeavor uh, trying to do this on my own, do that on my own? It's not going to alter the stock of happiness or distress that I'm going to get. 
So therefore, people would stick it out in their relationships, in their social arrangements. But the West operates under supposedly superior knowledge. It's all up to you. You can be all that you can be. <laughs> Don't submit to unhappy circumstances. <laughs> be the change that you want to see. <laughs> be all that you can be. <laughs> so the pressure is on you, right? To always make these, these instant decisions, these calculations. I gotta act for my happiness. This is not happy anymore. What should I choose instead? <laughs> and this way people waste their whole life. And then when you point out to them that no matter how much you endeavor, you're not going to change your sum total of material happiness that you're due because your karma, they say, well, what do you want out of me? If I don't endeavor for happiness, that means I do nothing. But Krishna says, no. If you don't endeavor for material happiness, then you endeavor for what is beyond material happiness. You endeavor to give pleasure to Krishna because you are his part. And because you're pleasing Krishna and you're part of Krishna, automatically you will be satisfied without endeavoring for your own satisfaction. That is the secret of bhakti. Unfortunately, here we are struggling in the material world as if we had no connection to Krishna. We're entities unto ourselves and we got to get what we need for ourselves. No one's going to help us. It's all up to us. Sink or swim. The pressure is on you, right? You've got to work hard. You've got to struggle hard. You've got to consume in the wisest way. And then die peacefully. No, you're overloaded with regrets after a life of pursuing material happiness. Supposedly your constitutional right, pursuit of happiness, you die overburdened with regrets. Because Maya doesn't give you insight into how you're wasting your life until it's too late. And that's how cruel the illusory energy is. Just when you can't even pretend to do something about it, then Maya lets you see a little bit. You see how I fooled you? It's too late for you to take advantage of this knowledge, but this is what I did to you. Oh, your heart just burns. This, these thoughts torture dying people. This is what hospice workers say. They have to be with these persons and try to lessen that mental anxiety of a wasted life. I shouldn't have done this. Why did I allow myself to get caught up? Why did I allow myself to be so influenced and so coerced and emotionally blackmailed? I never acted for my real happiness. Of course, they don't know what real happiness is. So we'd like to humbly present the world's greatest happiness science. In fact, it's so great that what Krishna is offering is beyond happiness. Because remember, material happiness comes and goes like the winter and summer season. Krishna doesn't want to give you that. Krishna wants to give us what is not simply far beyond material happiness. He wants to give us something of a completely different quality than material happiness. And we begin to taste that as we chant Hare Krishna in the association of devotees as we participate in the kirtan, as we hear about Krishna from Bhagavad Gita and Srimad Bhagavatam. You can taste it in the prasad. You can taste it in the presence of the deities. This is Krishna coaxing you onward. There's something better to be had for your life. And upon attaining it, you'll never have any regrets. Even just striving to attain it, you'll have no regrets. So finally, remember Narayan Muni's instruction. Better you try for Krishna, even if you may slip up. Your life is much better. You're a better position than someone who executes a lifetime of material activities perfectly. This knowledge of bhakti is so important and 
our whole community here is dedicated to teaching the science of bhakti and living in that way. This is the greatest contribution to progress in the world. Thank you very much. Our karma by performing acts of charity under the assumption that we are benefiting others? The science of balancing your bad karma with your good karma is very intricate and basically it's impossible in this day and age. We don't have that kind of sophisticated material understanding of the laws of karma and our life is so short comparatively to the lifespans mentioned in the Vedic literature. And the allurements are so intense. There's so many pitfalls. What if you open a hospital? But in the hospital that you open, as a charitable deed, good karma, in that hospital, you're serving meat. There's always something that you're going to trip up on because the laws of karma are so intricate. Even during the Vedic age, it would be very difficult to be on top of every karmic intricacy. That's why there were so many rishis and sages to advise kings. <laughs> because the path is so tricky. It's called karma kanda, the path of karma. Performing good works to balance the bad activity. It's so tricky and you can easily slip up. That's why in the sixth canto of Bhagavatam, you read sixth canto of Bhagavatam? What do the messengers of Yamaraj say to the Vishnu who is the messengers of Vishnu? When the messengers of Vishnu say, tell us who are just candidates, who are proper candidates for punishment. And what do, what do the Yama do this? The messengers of Yamaraj reply? They say, actually, anyone in this world, sooner or later, we're going to get it. They may be performing good karma, punya, in this lifetime. In the next lifetime, though, they're sure to slip up, and when they do, we'll be there. <laughs> That's how intricate this world is. <clears throat> the best way to change your karma is Krishna's way, what he says at the end of Bhagavad Gita. Give up all your methods, shut down your plan-making factory, take my plans, I take care of your karma, don't worry. <laughs> that is the most effective way of altering your karma. Yes? Hey, Krishna Maharaj, thank you for this nice lecture. Um, I see in America there is such a pressure and rat race for, universe, for parents to send their children to the best universities and I'm seeing that... I don't know anything right. about that. <laughs> in dealing with younger students who are in high school, I even see this pressure now that they work so hard to take the best classes to eventually go to the best universities. And some of them are becoming devotees. So I would like to humbly ask you if you can give any advice how to um, cultivate these young students so that they don't get totally discouraged in their material aspirations. Krishna says in Bhagavad Gita, whatever you do, do as an offering to him. So if parents want that their children be very academically competitive, the parents also have to make sure that the child is spiritually centered. An expert parent can judge whether this academic competitiveness or job competitiveness is psychologically disturbing the child and also ruining the
the child's spiritual opportunities, which is, that's the most important thing. So I can't advise parents, you know, don't push your child academically, because that's what my parents did to me. <laughs> <laughs> But I can recommend that two months after I finished university, I was reading Bhagavad Gita, and eight months after I finished university, I was in the Brahmacharya Ashram. <laughs> My mother thought, oh, it's just a phase he's going through. <laughs> he's got his Yale degree, so after a few months, he'll just revert back to normal. That was 42 years ago. <laughs> the most important thing to focus on is how much is Krishna in the center? Whether the child is academically competitive or not, how much is the child having opportunity to be Krishna or not? The two don't have to contradict each other. And anyway, if you'd like me to comment further, academic activity these days is not really brahmana activity. It's competition, it's chatriya activity. <laughs> You've got to best the other persons in your school. That's chatriya. <laughs> That's not brahmana. Brahmana is peaceful. <laughs> but the school system is not designed to make you peaceful. <laughs> You've got to compete. You've got to swim with the sharks. All right, most parents want that for their children, so at least they should make sure that the child has opportunity to be Christian conscious. Okay, how does that say? <laughs> Anything else? Yes? Probably it was a very nice question. <clears throat> question for you, whether you push your children or not, they, <clears throat> if the children is shining or not, that is according to the karma or according to the pushing, and how does it work in the... <clears throat> Where the children are. Whether you push the children to shine in school or uh, whether you don't push the children. <coughs> I say do both. Push the child to do well in school and push the child to engage in Krishna's service. Is that not a karma too? Huh? To become a Krishna conscious, is that a karma? Is it, is it your karma to become, to, to become Krishna conscious? Is that also a karmic thing that you can No, do? it's got nothing to do with your karma. If anything, it's got something to do with devotional service, bhakti you've done in your previous life. Or you can be fortunate and just by contact with Lord Chaitanya, Srila Prabhupada, Srila Prabhupada's devotees, you start from scratch in this lifetime. But it's not karmic. It's something outside of karma. So, you want your child to be academically successful, okay, but make sure the child has ample opportunity to be Krishna conscious. Thank you. I thank you all for your kind attention. <laughs>